going to introduce you to the world of helicopter flight and give you a leg up on your helicopter rating. The FAA, in licensing helicopter pilots, considers it a rating on the private or commercial pilot certificate. You do not have to have an airplane rating prior to getting a helicopter rating. So for those of you using these tapes as a ground school for your helicopter written test, you will still need to get a private pilot study course. There are several good ones available on video, home study courses, or weekend ground schools. Much of the information we will give you is highly technical, so stop and review the tape as often as necessary. Five areas will be covered. In tape one, you will be introduced to helicopters, including components, uses, and the most common training models. Rotary wing aerodynamics will be reviewed, and there are a lot of those. And finally, helicopter flight planning will be covered at the end of tape one. Tape two begins with a pre-flight walk around inspection of the Robinson R-22, a common training helicopter, followed by demonstrations of basic maneuvers. Some special procedures involving navigation and operations close out tape two. Throughout all this material is the information you need to pass the written exam for the helicopter rating. We will not identify specific questions and their word-for-word -word answers because those are updated from time to time, but the basic principles of helicopter flight remain the same. These tapes are also not flight instruction. I cannot stress enough that you are going to need personal quality flight instruction before you will be ready to go out and fly a helicopter. Although we will be showing you generally how some maneuvers are performed, this is only to demonstrate certain aspects of helicopter flight and to show you what to expect from your flight instruction. And that is a hallmark of a sporties videotape, the real world. What this means is that after you watch a sporties video, you will know what to expect in the cockpit as well as in theory. What you will be seeing in this video are real helicopters in actual operation, enhanced with appropriate graphics. In short, Sporties will always bring you the best, and in keeping with that pledge, I would like to introduce my co-host for this introduction to the helicopter rating, Don Fairbanks. Don is one of the most knowledgeable and experienced aviators in the world. Don has over 30,000 flight hours logged, including service in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He is a gold seal flight instructor, FAA designated flight examiner, and holds about every rating available. For over 30 years, Don and his family have owned and operated Cardinal Air Training in Cincinnati, Ohio. And until recently, he built and raced airplanes in the Reno Air Races, placing first several times in his class. Thanks for that excellent introduction, Rob. There are four points that will be stressed throughout this video that if followed throughout your instruction and rating will make you a safe and capable helicopter pilot. The first is something that Rob's already mentioned. You will need a lot of personal flight instruction from a qualified flight instructor. This is true not only to get your rating, but also recurrent training is necessary to stay sharp. Secondly is that helicopters fly differently than airplanes. A skillful airplane pilot is still required to receive a minimum of 30 hours flight training prior to the rating. Some of the same control inputs used in successful piloting of an airplane have completely different effects on the flight of a helicopter. And third, helicopters are inherently unstable aircraft, requiring constant and correct control inputs to maintain the fine balance of aerodynamic forces which allow helicopters to fly. One of these controlling forces necessary for continued flight is rotor RPM. Without rotor RPM, the helicopter pilot is unable to maintain the aircraft's equilibrium and maintain controlled flight. The point here is not to try to scare you out of helicopter flying, but merely to emphasize some truths about these magnificent machines. If you will remember that you need personal instruction, that helicopters fly differently than airplanes, and that they are inherently unstable, and that you must maintain correct rotor RPM, then you should have a safe and rewarding career as a helicopter pilot. Helicopters are safe machines, extremely useful, and for the most part, very fun to fly. Many helicopter mishaps have occurred at low velocity and altitude and are usually much more damaging to the aircraft and the pilot's ego than the aircraft itself. The majority of the accidents that are publicized occur in poor weather or other hazardous conditions. 
This is because of the helicopter's frequent use as a search and rescue vehicle, often going to remote locations where other transportation cannot reach. The chances are very good that you are wanting a helicopter rating for personal or business use. In that respect, a helicopter is a very reliable and safe form of transportation. Some helicopters have a better safety rating than many other single-engine aircraft, including airplanes. That's a very good point, Rob. And a helicopter is one of the most useful vehicles ever invented. Every day, somebody comes up with a new application. Helicopters have an unlimited field of motion, making them a go-anywhere, all-terrain vehicle that cannot be equaled for sightseeing. Truly, you're winded of the world. But again, it takes know-how, not just want to, to become a capable helicopter pilot. Let's take a closer look at two of the popular training helicopters, the Hughes and the Enstrom. John Schweller is a businessman and owner of a Hughes 300. Uh, I've owned a 500, which is a little bit bigger ship, it's very nimble, and a jet ranger. But this seems to be, uh, for the type of work I do for the sheriff's office, uh, getting in and out of cornfields, uh, on uh, personnel rescue, uh, I usually involved a lot in, in uh, drug work, and it's very easy to get down in the uh, fence lines next to trees, and uh, I've used it for fishing kids. I'm on call 24 hours a day, so I fish, to fish kids out of lakes, if they, can get, if they can get a hold of the runner on this, I can drag them over away from the holes they've broken into. And uh, it's a very nimble, quick machine. I love helicopters. It's the quickest way to get anywhere, and I fell in love with it when uh, I seen Don Fairbanks flying one. The Enstrom is a bit larger and more expensive. Jim Zimmerman is an accomplished Enstrom pilot. The Enstrom is a three-place helicopter. It's made in two models. It has a fully articulating rotor system. It has a turbocharged engine. It will pick up 2,650 pounds. The helicopter will normally carry three people, and we do that by pulling the center collective out. There's a pin down here in the center. We just pop the pin, insert a cushion, and we're all set for three passengers. It's a very smooth flying helicopter and does a very nice out of rotation due to the three bladed system. Let's begin by classifying helicopters. They are one of two types of aircraft in the rotorcraft category. First, there's the gyroplane, which also uses a large rotor in addition to the airplane style propeller. The difference between a gyroplane and a helicopter besides a propeller is that the overhead rotor of the gyroplane is not engine driven, except maybe for the initial startup. So rather than air being driven down by the rotor as in a helicopter, air moves upward through the rotor, causing it to spin, providing a lift vector. An unwarranted axiom I heard about helicopters recently called them 10,000 moving parts trying to do you bodily harm. While they are not trying to do you any bodily harm, a helicopter is composed of many separate components, all with their specific functions. That saying was obviously concocted by a die-hard airplane pilot. A helicopter, in its most basic sense, consists of three main components. The main rotor, the tail rotor, and the fuselage. The main rotor provides both lift and thrust, handling the duties of altitude, speed, and direction of flight. The tail rotor, also referred to as the anti-torque rotor, determines the heading of the aircraft as well as counteracting the torque created by the main rotor. The fuselage is a load bearing and mounting structure for the rotors, the landing gear, and occupants. Beyond that, we'll get into more detail in the aerodynamics and pre-flight section of the program. How helicopters are used is a function of what they can do. They are primarily a short-range, multi-purpose vehicle that can be operated from small areas without the need for extensive site preparation. Helicopters don't need long runways like airplanes, or dual highways and parking lots like cars, but they are relatively more expensive to operate. Many of the moving parts of a helicopter are limited in their service lives, which means that after a certain number of hours, they're thrown away and new parts are installed. 
The transmission and the engine are about the only moving parts that can be overhauled. But even so, they can be very economical to operate if their special capabilities are used. One of the best examples of this is a surveying team in Alaska that were helicoptered into their work sites. There were no available runways or roads, and the team could complete several sites per day with the use of the helicopter, where it had taken several days to reach each of the sites by other means. As you will see, helicopters can also be operated into and out of confined spaces and get to vantage points only available from such a machine as this. Watch television more closely and notice how many scenes you see that can only be taken from a helicopter. The four helicopters which are most commonly used for training are the Bell 47 series, the Hughes Schweitzer 269 series, the Enstrom, and the Robinson R-22, which is the newest of the four. Cardinal Air Training has used all four at one time or another, and each has its own advantages and disadvantages. The helicopter we will be using most in this video is the one Don presently operates, the Robinson R-22. The R-22 is a simple, relatively economical to operate and honest to fly. It's honest in that it does for the pilot what's expected, so much so that Robinson issued a safety notice about pilots becoming too confident too quickly. It has very quick and responsive handling that many pilots like, but which also calls for increased alertness and caution on the part of the pilot. We caution you to become competent, but for sure not overconfident in any vehicle, not just helicopters. As we begin to talk about aerodynamics, I am reminded of yet another saying about helicopters. Helicopters do not fly, they beat the air into submission. This saying, like the other, is not exactly true. Helicopters fly because of the Bernoulli principle, the same thing that causes an airplane to fly. Airflow around an airfoil produces lift, but the similarities between airplane flight and helicopter flight are very few beyond that. Airplanes fly by moving the entire airframe through the air, including the stationary or fixed wing. As the wing or airfoil moves horizontally through the air, vertical lift component is produced, lifting the aircraft. The helicopter flies by rotating the airfoil, while the fuselage remains stationary, resulting in a classification as rotary wing aircraft. Lift is increased or decreased by varying the rotor pitch angle, and thrust is produced by tilting the rotor disc in whichever direction is desired. The rotor disc is a term for the rotor system in motion, which appears as a semi-opaque disc. The pitch angle of the rotor blades is controlled by the pilot with the collective control, so-called because it changes the pitch angle of all the blades the same amount, or collectively. As the pitch angle is changed, so is the angle of attack, which increases or decreases the lift produced by the blade. The rotor disc is tilted through a control called the cyclic stick. The stick is moved in the desired direction of travel, which can be either forward, backward, or any direction in between. You're going to see that all of the controls are interrelated, making coordination of supreme importance in piloting a helicopter successfully. For example, as the collective is raised, which is called simply up collective, the pitch angle of the rotor blades is increased. This produces more lift, but as you should recall, as angle of attack and lift are increased, drag is also increased. So throttle must be added to maintain proper rotor RPM. When the throttle is increased, torque is increased. Torque is the force created as the engine, which is mounted in the fuselage, turns the rotor. One of the basic laws of motion says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If the action is to turn the rotor counterclockwise, then the reaction must be to try to turn the fuselage clockwise. If it were not for the action of the tail rotor, a helicopter would spin continuously. The tail rotor provides a thrust vector in the direction opposite of the torque, keeping the helicopter pointed in the correct direction. So as torque is increased by increasing the power, the tail rotor thrust must be increased. Tail rotor thrust is controlled by foot pedals, whose operation increases or decreases the pitch of the tail rotor blades. The greater the pitch angle, the greater the tail rotor thrust. Because of their function, they're also sometimes called anti-torque pedals. Tail rotor RPM is directly proportionate to the main rotor RPM. This is another reason RPM control is so important. If rotor RPM drops dangerously low, 
tail rotor effectiveness is diminished first. As an example, let's say that for every main rotor revolution, the tail rotor makes five. If the main rotor loses only 20 RPM, the tail rotor has lost 100. If tail rotor effectiveness is lost, the helicopter begins to spin uncontrollably because of torque, disorienting the pilot very, very quickly. Let's take a closer look at another way of countering torque. The McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Corporation has developed NOTAR, a no-tail rotor concept. The elimination of the complex tail rotor drive mechanisms and enhanced maneuverability are characteristics of a NOTAR system, making it worthy of note. The NOTAR utilizes the Coanda effect to help counteract torque. Pressurized air from a variable pitch fan in the modified tail boom pushes air out of horizontal slots at the 70 and 140 degree points. This creates a boundary airflow which the main rotor downwash attaches itself to, generating lift on that side of the boom and thus counteracting torque. Directional control is provided by direct jet thrusters on each side of the tail boom. The enhanced maneuverability includes sideward flight of up to 40 knots and rearward flight of 30 knots. A no-tar system can literally back into the tops of trees with no tail rotor to get tangled in the branches. With its lower noise and vibration levels, no-tar should soon find its way into everyday operation. So the pilot must manipulate the collective control, the cyclic control, the throttle and foot pedal simultaneously, constantly, and correctly to achieve controlled flight. I'm sure you can see why plenty of instruction and practice will be required, and how differently they fly than airplanes. The helicopter's rotor disc is producing lift perpendicular to the plane of the disc. As the disc is horizontal, the lift is vertical. As the disc is tipped in any direction from vertical by movement of the cyclic stick, the lift vector is also tipped in the same direction, moving the aircraft in that direction. And this is another way that helicopters do not fly like airplanes. The direction the nose is pointed has little bearing on which direction the helicopter is moving. As you see here, the helicopter can swing in a full 360 degrees while maintaining a straight ground track. As you will see more clearly as we proceed, there are many forces constantly acting on a helicopter, making it unstable. It's difficult to show real-world control of the cyclic stick because the manipulation of the cyclic stick amounts to constant and tiny movements, correcting for unwanted aircraft movements and initiating the desired movements. Those are the bare basics of helicopter aerodynamics. Now let's go a little deeper. The rapidly spinning rotor blades behave like a large gyroscope, and as such, they are subject to a phenomenon known as gyroscopic precession. Gyroscopic precession dictates that when a force is applied to a rapidly spinning object, the reaction occurs 90 degrees away from the axis the force was applied. Watch this aircraft directional gyroscope. As I attempt to move the dial horizontally, the attached gyroscope reacts vertically 90 degrees off axis of the movement of the dial. This little demonstration and explanation of gyroscopic precession lays the groundwork for how the helicopter is controlled by the cyclic stick. As the cyclic stick is moved, a series of control rods and linkages increases the rotor pitch angle on one side of the disc only. This increases the blade's angle of attack at that point creating more lift there. This increased lift at one point tilts the disc 90 degrees off the axis of the increased lift due to gyroscopic precession. So, to go forward, lift is applied on the helicopter's left, tilting the disc to the front. The control linkages are designed to compensate for gyroscopic precession. So the pilot only needs to move the cyclic stick in the desired direction. Let's look at some of the hardware responsible for this complex control. The cyclic and collective control inputs are transferred to the rotor by the swashplate assembly. 
The swash plate assembly consists of two discs, one which rotates, one which remains stationary. The non-rotating disc is sometimes called the stationary star. The rotating disc is called the rotating star. A bearing surface between the two allows them to interface with minimal friction. As a control is moved, the stationary star moves, pushing on the rotating star. If the collective is used, movement occurs equally all around the swash plate assembly. If the cyclic is used, the swash plate is tipped and the helicopter moves in the desired direction. The rotating star is connected to the rotor hub by pitch change links, which vary the pitch of the rotor blades. You will notice that the pitch change links are connected 90 degrees away from the appropriate blade, compensating for gyroscopic precession. Because of the close interrelationships involved in helicopters, most instructors wish they could teach everything first. Since that is impossible, we must take things one at a time. Another important control is the throttle, the primary control for RPM maintenance. The throttle is adjusted by a twist grip on the collective control similar to a motorcycle. In flight, the engine is connected to the rotor by a fully engaged clutch and transmission. So in flight, the throttle controls both the engine and rotor RPM. The helicopter's tachometer has needles for both rotor and engine RPM. When they're in their proper relationship for flight, they read equally, or they're married, as many say. To make the pilot's workload easier, many manufacturers have developed a correlation device, so-called because it correlates the collective control and the throttle. As we have mentioned, as up collective is applied, throttle must also increase. The correlation device handles some of this for the pilot, adjusting the throttle, the appropriate amount for each collective change. We've seen that the cyclic controls direction, and the throttle and collective control the power and RPM. So it would seem that the only limits to forward speed would be structural and power related, like an airplane. But as we know, helicopters, they don't fly like airplanes. The helicopter airspeed gauge has a red never exceed line, just like the airplane gauge. While they do mean that a less than ideal speed is being reached, the reasons why are totally different from an airplane. There's a gremlin in helicopters known as retreating blade stall, or sometimes called retreating tip stall. To better understand retreating blade stall, Visualize the helicopter in a hover in a no-wind condition. As an example, let's say the tips of the blade are moving at 400 miles per hour. So airflow is 400 miles per hour all around the disc. As the helicopter moves forward to a speed of 100 miles an hour, the airflow over the advancing blade is 400 miles per hour plus the 100 mile per hour forward speed. However, the retreating blade has an airflow that is 400 miles per hour rotation speed minus the 100 mile per hour forward speed, or only 300 miles per hour. In the extreme case, there is not enough airflow over the retreating blade to generate lift, so it stalls. You should remember that steep turns and turbulence at high air speeds can aggravate a retreating blade stall situation. And on a practical level, retreating blade stalls are not practiced in helicopters the same way stalls are practiced in airplanes. But at any forward speed, there is less lift generated on the retreating blade than the advancing blade, and this effect is called dissymmetry of lift. If this were not compensated for, the helicopter would have a constant tendency to roll into the retreating blade. So along with everything else going on, the rotor system compensates for dissymmetry of lift by blade flapping and feathering. Both blade flapping and feathering happen automatically. As the rotor blades turn, the pitch of the retreating blade is increased, giving an extra lift, and the pitch of the advancing blade is decreased, lessening its angle of attack and therefore its lift. This helps compensate for dissymmetry of lift. The second thing that occurs is that because of the inherent decreased lift of the retreating blade, it tends to move downward. This downward movement on the retreating blade and the upward movement on the advancing blade, because of its inherent added lift, is called blade flapping. On some helicopters, 
there is a flapping hinge built into the rotor hub allowing flapping to occur freely. On two blade models, the blade flaps as a unit on a teetering hub. The retreating blade flaps downward, the angle of attack of the relative wind is increased, generating extra lift. As the advancing blade flaps up because of its extra lift, the angle of attack of the relative wind is decreased, tending to lessen lift generated there. So the retreating blade feathers to increase pitch and flaps down for increased lift, and the advancing blade decreases its pitch angle and flaps up for decreased lift. Both of these actions help equalize lift over the rotor disc and compensate for disymmetry of lift. Let's take a closer look at the development of a stall on the rotor blade. In reality, a blade will not stall all at once. The stall actually begins at each end of the blade and works toward the middle. The inboard area stalls due to its relative slower velocity, and the outboard tip stalls because of its higher angle of attack. As the stall develops, lift is diminished and the helicopter will begin to roll into this lack of lift. There is another law of motion which applies to helicopter rotor blades. It is known as the conservation of angular momentum, which states that as the center of mass of a rotating body moves close to the axis of rotation, velocity will increase. Watch as the skater's arms are moved closer to the body, which is the axis of rotation. The speed of the spin increases. The same happens as the skater's arms are moved upward. The distance between the center of the mass of the arms and the axis of rotation decreases, and the speed increases. The same is true of a helicopter's rotor blades and is known as Coriolis effect. As the blade flaps upward, the blade wants to speed up, and as the blade flaps downward, its center of mass gets further from the hub and it wants to slow down. This would put a strain on the blades and a rotor hub if it were not for the lead lag hinges built into the blade roots. The lead lag hinges allow Coriolis effect to take place without damage or strain on a rotor system. Coriolis effect is less pronounced on two-bladed systems because they are underslung with respect to the rotor hub, making the change in the center of mass from the rotation point less. The next aerodynamic factor we want to cover is called coning. This is the result of the entire weight of the helicopter being suspended from the rotor blades. Notice how the blades bend as the weight of the model hangs from the rotor. This upward bending is called coning. Prior to takeoff, centrifugal force is a major force acting on the blades and they tend to remain perpendicular to the rotor mast. As lift is increased by raising the collective, the blades tend to bend upward as the load on a rotor disc increases. There are three basic types of rotor systems called fully articulated, semi-rigid and rigid. Fully articulated rotor systems are multi-bladed systems in which the blades lead, lag, flap and feather. Semi-rigid systems are typically two-bladed systems mounted on a teetering hinge which allows the blades to feather and to flap as a unit. A rigid rotor system allows only for the blades to feather or to change their pitch angle. I hope that we have firmly established a relationship between pitch angle, lift, and power as they relate aerodynamically to the helicopter. If you will remember that as up collective is applied, the pitch angle of the rotor blade increases and lift is generated, along with the accompanying drag. Whether with a correlation device or the twist grip on the collective handle, RPM must be maintained by the throttle. Since RPM should remain fairly constant, it cannot be used to measure the amount of power being used. That is done with a manifold pressure gauge. As you begin your flight instruction, you should begin to equate in your mind the relationship between manifold pressure and the angle of attack of the rotor blades. Notice that on the manifold pressure gauge there is a yellow caution range and a red never exceed mark. When operating at or above the red line of manifold pressure, the gauge is telling you that in the event of an engine failure, the helicopter may not be able to execute a safe power-off landing. 
This is because at a high angle of attack, which also means high drag, the rotor RPM will decrease rapidly. Since RPM is necessary for control, the aircraft will become uncontrollable very, very quickly. The yellow and red ranges will vary from helicopter to helicopter because of the different rotor system. Because of inertia stored in the blades, a heavy bladed system would decelerate at a slower rate than a light bladed system. Therefore, a heavy bladed system should have a higher manifold pressure allowance before the danger area would be reached. Let's take some practical examples of manifold pressure and RPM mismatches. I'll give you the situation and you explain the proper correction. First, let's say we have low RPM and low manifold pressure. By increasing the throttle only, we will increase both the RPM and the manifold pressure simultaneously. How about low RPM and high manifold pressure? By lowering the collective, the pitch angle of the rotor blades will be decreased. This decreases the drag and RPM will increase and manifold pressure will drop. High RPM and high manifold pressure. If we reduce the RPM with the throttle, we will also reduce the manifold pressure without moving the collective. High RPM and low manifold pressure. If we raise the collective, it will increase the angle of attack to the main rotor, increase drag, and reduce RPM. These examples show you how one control change can accomplish two purposes. Using this reasoning, you can see how various control inputs can be coordinated to achieve any desired RPM and manifold pressure combination. As with any other aircraft, large abrupt control changes of collective or throttle should be avoided. All corrections should be accomplished through the use of smooth inputs. We are ready now to approach one of the most important aspects of helicopter flight, the pre-flight. The pre-flight for any aircraft begins nowhere near it. Always ask yourself if you are ready to fly. Are you properly rested, mind completely on the flight, and are you alcohol free? The regulations mandate eight hours from the time of your last drink prior to piloting an aircraft. But the pilot's saying of 24 hours from bottle to throttle is more wise. Secondly, are you qualified for the flight? Do you have a proper checkout and rating for the aircraft you are about to command? Have you had a complete and personal weather briefing? And are you familiar with a specific aircraft and its manual as required by the FARs? A time of crisis is no time to be reading aircraft procedures. It's vital that you are completely familiar with the aircraft handbook prior to beginning even a pre-flight. A handbook is shipped out with each helicopter and is one of the required items to be carried in the helicopter at all times. Let's begin right at the beginning where you'll notice that the FAA has approved some sections of the handbook for the Robinson R-22. Some handbooks may have fewer approved sections, others more. What this means is that these are sections of the handbook that the pilot and command must adhere to while operating. The FAA has sanctioned this information as necessary to be in compliance with the FARs. Sections that are not FAA approved still should be heeded because they contain vital information as well. The handbook from the manufacturer tells you what the helicopter will and will not do, and most importantly, what is safe. There is a format for all aircraft handbooks, dividing them into various sections. Each section covers a specific area of information about that aircraft. And since the format is standardized, if Section 2 in the Robinson R-22 deals with operating limitations, then Section 2 in a Cessna Citation Jet would deal with operating limitations. It's important to note that many older manuals were made prior to the standardized format, so they will be slightly different. Very briefly, here's the format for a current pilot operating handbook for the Robinson R-22. Section 1 contains descriptive data including abbreviations and definitions used throughout the manual. Section 2, as we mentioned before, deals with operating limitations. Emergency procedures are in Section 3, and Section 4 is normal procedures. Section 5 is performance charts. Section 6 is weight and balance data and loading instructions. Section 7 describes the helicopter's systems,
such as controls, engine and fuel systems. Handling, servicing, and maintenance items are included in Section 8, and Section 9 is supplementary data for optional equipment or packages on the helicopter. Section 10 is safety tips and notices. I find this section particularly helpful in that a lot of safety tips and notices come from actual occurrences that the manufacturer feels could occur again if the pilot were not made aware of the possibility. For example, safety notice number one deals with inadvertent actuation for the mixture control in flight and offers procedures to avoid a recurrence. And here again is another way that helicopters do not fly like airplanes. The mixture is not leaned in flight. Since there's no flywheel in most helicopters, at the point where the mixture gets too lean, the engine will quit. Another example of good information in a safety notice is item number 24, which deals with low RPM rotor stall. This one includes a very good aerodynamic discussion of the causes and again offers a procedure to avoid it. Since each helicopter is different, we won't go into the entire manual for the Robinson, but we will examine a couple of charts that are peculiar to most helicopters. All helicopters are designed for certain load limits and balance conditions. Any pilot who takes off in a helicopter that is not within the designed load and balance condition is not only violating FAA regulations, but is inviting trouble. In loading a helicopter, there are four weights to consider. The empty weight is the helicopter without the usable fuel, people, and or baggage. Included in the empty weight is a helicopter structure, power plant, all fixed equipment, ballast, unusable fuel, oil, hydraulic fluid, or engine coolant. The useful load, or the payload, is the weight of the pilot, passengers, baggage, usable fuel, and any ballast needed to offset a lightly loaded or out of balance helicopter. Gross weight is the empty weight plus the useful load. Each aircraft has a maximum gross weight, which is the most weight for which the helicopter is certified for flight. Even though the helicopter is certified for a certain maximum gross weight, it may not be safe to take off at this weight under all conditions. Certain combinations of altitude, temperature, and humidity may result in a density altitude making it impossible to perform a safe takeoff, hover, climb, or landing. Remember, the helicopter doesn't care what true altitude is. The helicopter performs according to density altitude, and it should be figured for each flight and expected helicopter performance for the density altitude noted. Besides the weight factor, the load must be arranged so that the center of gravity is within limits. The center of gravity, also referred to as the CG, is the point where the helicopter is in balance, both front to rear and side to side in a level pitch attitude. If the helicopter were suspended by a cable at the CG point, it would hang absolutely level. Since the helicopter is not always loaded exactly the same way every time, we must have an envelope or area in which the CG must fall for proper balance. This is known as the CG range. The CG range is measured in inches from the datum for four and a half CG range and inches left or right of the center line for lateral CG. The datum is a fixed point established by the aircraft manufacturer from which all measurements are taken for the weight and balance calculations. This reference point can be established anywhere, but once established it does not move. It may be something that can be seen such as the front of the bubble or a non-visual point such as in the Robinson which has a datum measured 100 inches forward of the main rotor shaft. Each item or person that is placed in the helicopter must be added to the weight, its arm measured, and its moment figured. Once loaded and the helicopter's weight and balance calculated, it is then compared with a handbook to make sure it is loaded safely. If you need some additional instruction on weight and balance, you should review the private pilot course where it is explained in detail. Something that is different in helicopters is the figuring of lateral CG. Each item placed on one side of the helicopter will have a positive value 
while the other side will have a negative value. Also, both the takeoff CG position and the landing CG position must be figured. Remember, as fuel burns, the CG will change, possibly creating an unsafe loading at some point during the trip, and an unsafe loading can cause the aircraft to be uncontrollable. When the helicopter is delivered from the factory, all the necessary data are included on the weight and balance sheet included in the helicopter flight manual. Each helicopter delivered can be different due to optional equipment installed to customize to each owner's needs. After delivery, the owner-operator may decide to remove or add equipment, so the weight and balance figures will be corrected and all changes will be entered in the appropriate aircraft record. Always use the latest weight and balance information for the specific aircraft you are flying. Let's take a closer look at lateral weight and balance in a helicopter. As an example, we'll carry a 170-pound passenger in the left seat and a 180-pound pilot in the right seat. There is no baggage and the tanks filled with 102 pounds of fuel. The helicopter's basic empty weight is 830 pounds. During the trip, 80 pounds of fuel are used. We know from the longitudinal calculations that the CG is 98.06 inches aft of datum at takeoff and 97.36 inches upon landing, which is within limits. The left seat lateral arm is a negative 9.3 for a moment of negative 1,581 pound inches. The right seat lateral arm is a positive 10.7 for a positive 1,926 pound-inch moment. There are 102 pounds of fuel with a lateral arm of negative 11.0 for a moment of negative 1,122 pound-inches on takeoff and a negative 242 pound-inches on landing. On takeoff, the gross weight is 1,282 pounds. The takeoff moment is a negative 777, so the takeoff lateral CG is negative 0.6. After burning 80 pounds of fuel, the moment and gross weight change. The lateral moment is now a positive 103 pound inches, and gross weight is 1,202 pounds. The landing lateral CG is a positive 0.09. By plotting the CG positions on the CG envelope graph, we know that both longitudinal and lateral CG are acceptable for takeoff and landing. Limiting heights and corresponding airspeeds for a safe landing in the event of a power failure contained in a chart called airspeed versus altitude limitation chart. A more common term for this chart was the dead man's curve. It's now more commonly called the height velocity diagram. This is another chart prepared by the manufacturer giving the pilot the safe operating parameters for an altitude and airspeed necessary to complete a successful emergency landing. The altitude airspeed combinations to avoid are shown in the shaded areas of the chart. When power failure does occur, the helicopter is still controllable to a safe landing. The procedure for a non-powered touchdown is called an auto-rotation. During auto-rotation, the rotors are driven by airflow upward through the rotor system. Altitude is traded for rotor RPM to maintain controllability of the helicopter. At the appropriate time near the ground, the collective is raised, slowing the descent and using the inertial energy and RPM in the rotors to bring the helicopter to a safe landing. During auto rotation, two things are needed to keep the RPM up to where we have a controllable helicopter instead of a streamlined brick, altitude and airspeed. The helicopter powertrain is designed so that if the engine should cease driving the rotor, it is automatically disengaged from the rotor system, 
to allow rotation freely in the original direction. This device is called the freewheeling unit. Referring back to the height velocity diagram for the R-22, we find that if we are going to travel at a forward airspeed of 50 knots, we should avoid altitudes between 70 and 270 feet above ground level. There are also minimum altitudes for certain speeds as well. If we are cruising at 80 knots, then we should avoid altitudes lower than 25 feet above the ground. In the low altitude, high airspeed portion of the diagram, the pilot risks a high speed landing in an aircraft not designed for it. In the larger, lower airspeed, higher altitude portion of the diagram, enough altitude is not available to compensate for the low airspeed to maintain rotor RPM. As the diagram indicates, the recommended takeoff profile is to climb to not above 10 feet and accelerate to 45 knots, then gain altitude while increasing airspeed to 60 knots and climb to the desired altitude. Other charts we would want to consult include the hovering in ground effect and hovering out of ground effect ceiling. We have reached the end of tape one. You have been introduced to the helicopter and its aerodynamics and shown the basics of preparing for flight. In tape two, we will begin with the second part of our pre-flight procedure, a walk around inspection. Then some basic maneuvers will be demonstrated and special procedures that are necessary for helicopter students to master as well as be familiar with for passing the test. The Sporties catalog features publications on helicopters you'll want to consider as you continue your rotary wing education. The first is the FAA Basic Helicopter Handbook, prepared by the U.S. Department of Transportation as a technical manual for those studying for their private, commercial, or flight instructor pilot certificates with a helicopter rating. In-depth discussions are supplemented by clear, easy-to-understand illustrations. How to Fly Helicopters is a comprehensive guide to helicopter aerodynamics, flight controls, and operating systems. Photographs and illustrations support the fine text by Larry Collier, revised by Kaz Thomas. Discussion of flight maneuvers and a detailed glossary round out the thorough coverage contained in this 226-page book. Rotary Wing Flight is a reprint of the Army Helicopter Training Manual. Within the pages of the same handbook used by military pilots, you'll discover aerodynamics, flight techniques, precautionary measures, and critical conditions as they apply to helicopter aviation. A glossary for quick reference makes learning easier. As mentioned earlier, you'll need a home study course to prepare for the private pilot written exam. Two of the best are the King and ATC private pilot video courses. In these 12 hours, you're exposed to everything you need to know to pass the test, including actual exam questions and their correct answers, explained in a clear, down-to-earth style. And finally, Sporties has published its own private pilot test guide, which not only includes the questions and their correct answers, but explains why the other answers listed are wrong. The vast amount of information contained in this comprehensive and updated test guide was compiled and researched by the Sporties Academy staff, giving you direct access to some of the best training in the aviation industry. To order any of these materials, use the catalog numbers listed with each item and call Sporties toll-free at 1-800-LIFTOFF. Your order will be shipped to you immediately. And as always, any phone order received before 5 p.m. Eastern Time will be shipped that same day. For over 26 years, flight instructors, flight schools, FBOs, and individual pilots have relied on Sporty's Pilot Shop for their educational needs. Whether you're working on a rating or sharpening your current skill and knowledge, our selection of books and videos will take you beyond the rating and make you a better pilot. Sporties Books and Videos, your leading edge in aviation education.